Mr. Speaker, I beg to lay the following motion stand in my name, whereas it is provided by Section 13 of the Public Finance Management Act, Cap 15.0 on the Act, that the Minister of Finance may, by an affirmative resolution of Parliament, borrow from a bank or other financial institution for the capital or current expenditure of government, and whereas it is further provided by Section 64 of the Act, that money borrowed by the government must be paid into and form part of the consolidated fund, and whereas the Minister of Finance considers it necessary to borrow from the Caribbean Development Bank the sum of US dollars 5.220 million to finance the building capacity and resilience in the health sector to respond to the coronavirus 2019 project, and whereas the loan is repayable in 20 years after the grace period of three years from the loan agreement date in 80 equal, approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments, and whereas the loan repayments commence on the first day of January, the first day of April, the first day of July, and the first day of October in each year, after a grace period of three years following the date of the loan, and on such later due date as the bank may specify in writing, and whereas interest is payable at a variable rate of 5.16 per annum on the amount of the principal disbursed and outstanding from time to time, on the first day of January, the first day of April, the first day of July, and the first day of October in each year, commencing after the date of the first disbursement of the loan, be it resolved that the Parliament authorizes the Minister for Finance to borrow from the Caribbean Development Bank the sum of US 5.22 million to finance the building capacity and resilience in the health sector to respond to the coronavirus 2019 project. Be it further resolved that the loan is repayable in 20 years after the grace period of three years from the loan agreement date in 80 equal, approximately equal and consecutive quarterly installments. The loan payments commence on the first day of January the first day of April and the first day of July and the first day of October in each year, after a grace period of three years following the date of the loan or on such later due date as the bank may specify in writing. Interest is payable <coughs> at the variable rate of 5.16 per annum on the amount of the principal disbursed and outstanding from time to time on the first day of January, the first day of April, the first day of July and the first day of October in each year commencing after the date of the first disbursement of the loan. Mr. Speaker, before I begin my explanation, I just want honorable members to note that the interest rate of this loan is 5.16%, which demonstrates how interest rates have begun to climb due to the external environment, Mr. Speaker. Interest rates that we have absolutely no control over have begun to climb. So whereas normally loans of this type will, will attract an interest rate of 2%, 3%, this time we have to have a variable rate of 5.16%, Mr. Speaker. Something that we have absolutely no control of since we do not, con we, do not we have no control on, on over the capital markets and interest rates are increasing worldwide. So St. Lucia is part of the world, so St. Lucia is not exempted from the increases in interest rates, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this resolution is seeking approval from the Parliament to borrow the sum of 5.2 million US dollars from the special funds reserves of the Caribbean Development Bank allocated from IDB COVID-19 OECS line of credits for the implementation of the St. Lucia building capacity and resilience in the health sector to respond to the coronavirus 2019 project. Mr. Speaker, the, the outbreak of COVID caused, caused a spread rapidly across the world from December 2019 to 2022. A global pandemic was declared <clears throat> on March 11, 2020 by the WHO, and approximately 
633.2 million confirmed cases and more than 6.5 million deaths have been recorded across 221 countries and regions as of November 17, 2022. And as November 17, 2022, a total of 12.8 million vaccine doses were administered. Like most of the other regional small island developing states, St. Lucia was affected by the COVID-19 pandemic and the country recorded its first case in March 2020. From 2020, the government instituted various control measures, including management of social gathering, the quarantine of suspected cases, and management of identified positive cases, close of borders to regional and international travel, sourcing of external medical support for the Cuban Medical Brigade, and administration of vaccines. As of December 20, 2022, there have been 29,754 confirmed cases of COVID-19 with 490 deaths in St. Lucia. As of December 30, 2022, a total of 55,083 persons have been fully vaccinated, 5,159 partially vaccinated, and 7,903 persons have received boosters. The pandemic, Mr. Speaker, has had a negative impact on all sectors of the society, social, economic, health, etc. The increase in demands on the health sector brought about by COVID-19 has undermined major progress in, a, in attaining the sustainable development goal number three, good health and well-being for all. Consultations with various stake stakeholders on the Ministry of Health and Wellness identify the COVID-19 disruptions constrained across constrained access to quality healthcare services, including essential services. Healthcare, healthcare personnel were profoundly impacted. And Mr. Speaker, I want to use this opportunity again to thank the member, the healthcare professionals who assisted us and who continued to work during the COVID pandemic, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, the overall expected impact of the virus of the virus project is to enhance the capacity of the public health care system to respond to current and emergent health security threats because it is said that there may be more pandemics to come. So we need to bolster the resilience in, in the health sector of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, the expected outcomes of this loan or what the money be used for is expected to improve capacity for surveillance case detection and monitoring, the establishment of initiatives to break the chain of transmission of the illness, and improved service delivery capacity. In order to achieve this, the project would comprise of the following. One, project support services, improving response to COVID-19 and emergent health threats. Two, minor works. And three, project management and auditing services costs. Mr. Speaker, let me explain the project components. Component number one, improving response to COVID-19 and emergent health threats. Subcomponent number one A, improving surveillance, case detection, and monitoring. This subcomponent will support actions to enhance, to enhance surveillance, facilitate case detection and monitoring, and improve data collection and recording. This includes the supply of and installation of, of lab equipment expansion of the COVID-19 response unit, procurement of consumables, information and, and communications technology, equipment, and other resources, as well as furniture and personnel for the COVID-19 response units. Subcomponent 1B, interrupting the chain of transmission. This component supports the provision of resources to halt or reverse the spread of COVID-19 and other emerging and re-emerging illnesses. Focus will be on communication, procurement of medical equipment, procurement of, transpo of transportation, reimbursables for services provided. I mean, the speaker, reimbursables for services provided are very important because there are a number of people who gave up their hotels to enable us to provide, to provide quarantine for, our, for the people who are diagnosed as positive. So these people have to be paid, Mr. Speaker. Subcomponent 1C, strengthening service delivery for critical care of COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 affected people. This component 
will support the, the procurement of resources for the Million Highway Medical Complex, the Respiratory Hospital, and the Public Dental Care Unit and support staff. Component number two, minor works. Subcomponent sub 2A, interrupting the chain of transmission. This component supports minor works for the enhancement of the respiratory hospital, which provides critical care for persons affected by COVID-19 and other infectious diseases. The activities below are urgently needed to provide a safe and conducive working environment for staff, safeguard the integrity of the physical infrastructure, as well as support the requirements of the, of, of the Occupational Health and Safety Act and the international and national protocols for infection control and safety. Subcomponent 2B, strengthening service delivery for critical care of COVID-19 and non-COVID-19 affected people. This subcomponent supports the continuity of care and will focus on dental health care. The focus will be on the rehabilitation of dental clinics to improve the observance of protocols and improve safety accommodation for clients and staff. Component number three, project management and auditing services. This segment of the project comprises several consultancies that will assist in the execution of the key activities of the project and which are aimed at enhancing efficiency in the procurement process, ensuring the, con the conduct of the end of project audits and covering other project management resources. Project management resources includes the establishment of a project coordinating unit, the following persons will be engaged. A project coordinator, a risk communications consultant, a procurement officer, a procurement specialist, a social inclus inclusion and gender mainstreaming training consulting firm for the design of supervision of works to improve the delivery of healthcare at the respiratory and dental health clinics. Mr. Speaker, this project is expected to be implemented over a period of 13 months. Mr. Speaker, as I read before, the loan is repayable in 20 years after a grace period of three years, and the government will repay the amount withdrawn from the loan account in 80 equal, approximately equal payments, Mr. Speaker. It, Mr. Speaker, and the loan is at a variable rate, and there is no commitment charge on, on, on this loan. And, Mr. Speaker, I spoke of the issues as they relate to interest rates, Mr. Speaker, which will have repercussions in the future. Mr. Speaker, this project presents to our country an, an opportunity to sustain the funding of many initiatives that have commenced in the fight against COVID-19 and to secure financing for new initiatives aimed at strengthening our healthcare system and combating any further spread of COVID-19. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I think all members of this honorable house will agree that this borrowing is essential. The COVID-19 pandemic caused severe disruption in the health services of the country, and it also caused social issues, Mr. Speaker. Social issues, issues in education. Many children could not go to school because there were no devices. They could not they could not homeschool because there were no devices, Mr. Speaker. And many people suffered from the fact that they could not go out, they could not socialize, they could not entertain, Mr. Speaker. So apart from the health effects, there were was, there was serious psycholog psychological effects of COVID. And I think people have not, we've not even started to understand what the impact of COVID may have had on our society on, and on our people, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, if you notice, there is a part of that loan we use to, for social inclusion projects, where we try to do research to really find out evidence-based, Mr. Speaker, evidence-based on the impact of COVID on the country, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I urge honorable members to support this motion as we continue our fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. I thank you, Mr. Speaker.